run around and I forgot how much of a cutthroat Harry and Mutlow really is, but he's at it. So this is good. So very, very good service. I'm really looking forward to it. We'll make some introductions a little bit. But let's start by standing to song number 495, Jesus Saves. So 495, let's stand together as we sing. Because that way we can go right into the live stream again. We'll do that. 
Okay, okay. I know that's a little unusual, but thank you very much. And then after that, we're going to have, of course, uh, evangelist Gerald Fielder preaching tonight. Looking forward to that. Appreciate uh, the time that uh, you've had with us this week and we've had with you. So we're for tonight's service and tomorrow, and it's going to be terrific. And, uh, so at this time, the singers will come. Is there an introduction that you need to make? Okay. <laughs>
excited about being here in Schenectady. This, this is, is just an awesome, awesome connection. The connections. connections. I have a son-in-law who has an aunt that lives here in, in Schenectady. Schenectady. Um, Hannah, Hannah over here is from Tulsa. Tulsa. Where's the lady at? <laughs> and, and, and that's this lady back here, here who's, who's the aunt of Hannah's, Hannah's best friend uh, in, in Tulsa. Tulsa. Right? right? Yeah. 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 Brother, brother Worship here. This is seeing my brother, brother, brother McCarthy back here, right? And, and his daughter's come to Harlan and Fall. His mother, he's, he's from, from Southwest and Oklahoma City. City so. so lots, lots of, of connections. It's, it's a small world after, after all. Yeah. 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 I'm not saying that. Yeah. So, so yeah. it's, it's a blessing to be with you. Mean, appreciate you passing over and say a little bit about our best Bible college. college. We've been in Oklahoma City, City now for 23 years. It's hard to be in the Lord. It's allowed us to have 23 years in Oklahoma City. We've been in Oklahoma 30 years in California, specific post-Baptist Bible College. And then in June 1998, the college packed up and moved everything. Can you imagine loading up moving trucks and moving a whole college, not the campus, but all the books and all of our furniture and everything moving out to Oklahoma City and we became Heartland Baptist Bible College and God has given us a wonderful, beautiful campus right there in the northwest part of the city in Oklahoma City and we are a ministry training college. We are there. I know there are Christian colleges that are out there. I know you've Got some folks that went to Pensacola, I understand that, but we, our goal is to train young men and women for the ministry, that's what we are about. We offer several different programs that would be designed for that. We have a missions program, we have a, a pastoral program, uh, we have missions for ladies, missions for men, we have a youth program, we have a ministry secretarial program, we offer a two year program for young ladies to come. and and learn how to be uh, a good secretary. I don't know how many pastors that have said if, if they could to hire a staff person, one of the first people they would hire is a secretary. And uh, you know if you're a pastor, your wife needs a type, you've got it made. <laughs> and uh, so besides all that anyway, all right? And then we offer a one-year Bible, Bible certificate. And I would encourage every young teenager to at least consider one year, one year of Bible college. That's right. We recently heard of a young man where we were at uh, this um, uh, this morning, yesterday. Sydney. Sydney, thank you. My days are all running together. We've had services every night this this week in Sydney. A young man from that church, or grandson of a lady from that church, came to Heartland, and he went for a year and just now he finished law school and he's already in a law firm. So I understand, you know, God doesn't call every young person to the ministry, but yet every young person ought to consider one year Bible college to nothing else, to build a, a biblical foundation under you. Because you and I know that colleges and university in America, uh, they're not going to they're not going to give you thumbs up for what you believe about the Word of God. In fact, if anything, they're going to tear down everything you believe about the Bible. So you need a foundation. Would you agree with that? Every young person needs a Bible foundation. So if you're interested in talking with us, we have a display out in the foyer. We have CDs available uh, for purchase uh, to help us to work our way through the... Um, eastern side of the United States through the summer months and we're going to make our way all the way down to South Carolina and uh, so if, if nothing else pray for us if you want to purchase those CDs uh, they are $12 a piece or three for $30 uh, there's a there's a couple of books out there one of them is uh, My Journey to Biblical Preaching written by Brother Sam Davison and his testimony about God's calling his life uh, in preaching, I, I believe my with all many of you. How many know brother, brother Sam Davidson? He's our was our president of our college for 20 years and stepped out. And now brother Jason Gaddis is our president of our college. I believe he's one of the premier fundamental Baptist preachers in America. I believe that. Yeah. And he wrote a book on his journey to biblical preaching. There's another book out there called 
a case for, uh, from Bible College written by a graduate of Heartland that talks about why Bible College, how to prepare for Bible College. Hey, we have Walmarts in Oklahoma. <laughs> You know that? I said, well, that's great. But what I say that, I say that and say this, you don't have to bring everything you own when you come to heart, you know? We have limited space. You can go to, you go to Walmart and get the stuff you need. To right? Uh, how to prepare. You know, you need to make preparations for Bible college. I believe one of, the, one of the most important things that a young person can do to prepare for Bible college is to begin now to have a daily walk with you. Because I think one of the easiest places in the world to backslide is in Bible college. Because we be, we make the book, the Bible, a a book for quizzes and such as that, and it really ought to be a life book. You ought to read it every day. Every Christian ought to read the Bible every day. So that that book talks about some of the spiritual preparations that you need for coming to Bible College. So come by the table. We've got a connect card that we'll fill out where we've got all kinds of social media platforms that are out there that you can connect. You can get on a website and get an app that is um, for our college and find out what's going on on a regular basis there in Oklahoma City. Again, Brother Horn, thank you for allowing us to be a part of the meeting tonight. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. We look forward to the Preaching other words. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, sir. All right. And this time, without further ado, we have our guest preacher, evangelist. What is your name? Last <laughs> <laughs> week. Yeah. It's <laughs> yeah, funny. I, I, I have, I'm having a Gerald Fielder. I have, I have a, 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 a brain burp right now. <laughs> You know what it is? It's that pizza. <laughs> oh, Phil, we had a great. I'll find something to blame it on. But uh, it's really, honestly, it's great to see each of you here tonight. And I really do appreciate seeing you. It's very, very good. You know, great job on the piano. Very, very good job. And uh, so, Brother Field, would you please come? And I uh, appreciate your fellowship, appreciate your friendship. And uh, he's got a life and a ministry built on the Word of God. So it's an honor to have you. Praise the Lord. Pastor, I bid you on the preacher and welcome to the service tonight. If you're glad to be here, give us a good rousing amen. Amen! I'd like to get amen. I'm glad to agree. He's parked there for a while. We'll dip that layer again. I would like an amen. A lot, a lot of churches are scared to death when someone says amen. I don't think it's true around here, so don't be holding back on that. Do you? Anyway, it's a blessing to be here tonight. I appreciate the good service thus far. We can leave now, so we've been blessed. Uh, good singing. Amen. Amen. And uh, I want to commend this church for that. Here's a church that has gone crazy with the music. Amen. And some of them have. By the way, that's a slippery slope. Uh, every time I've known of a church that go, went, went off the rails on music, they go off the rails on the Bible. So I'm down over that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's true or not, but I read somewhere a while back. We're in the church age, 2,000 years in the church age, that Christians have put to music and sung over 400,000 hymns. I don't know if it's true at all. I understand what I read. And I thought about that. I thought, have you ever heard a Muslim hymn? No. <laughs> no. They don't have any. They do a lot of chanting. They don't have any hymns. Because they don't have hymns, amen. That's right. We have something to sing about. Amen. Wonderful to sing about. And I thought about that. Uh, you know, our hymns have theology in them. And they're supposed to. I don't have a bit of use of this 7-11 stuff, 7 words 11 times, you know. And I thought about Acts chapter 16. I'm not preaching from that tonight, by the way. But I thought about Acts chapter 16. Where Paul and Silas were in prison at midnight, singing and praising the Lord. An earthquake took place. The jailhouse doors fell off their hinges. And all the stocks and bonds fell off them. Soldiers. And, and the Bible said in verse 30, the jailer said... Uh, can't call the light springs, what must I do to be saved? Yeah. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. But my question was, why did he say that? Because there's no indication that they, they was preached to. Uh, no tracts were given out, obviously. And I decided there's enough theology in those hymns they were singing. Yes, yeah. right. This guy decided I need what these guys have. Amen. 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 
We don't need to sing anything other than that. Amen. But anyway, I want you to open your Bibles tonight from, uh, from Matthew chapter 26. And I've done something tonight that I have not done in a long, long time. I've changed sermons on the way to the pulpit. And that is rare for me, but then once I settle on one, I'm just hardly ever going to change on that. But there were so many good themes in the music tonight. And uh, man, I went from one to another to another to another. Should I preach on that? Should I preach? Should I preach? Should I preach? <laughs> And, uh, and I really believe God spoke to my heart about this. I really do. There are 76 verse, 75 verses in Matthew chapter 26. I'd like to read all those, but I'm not. <laughs> I want to begin in verse 69, read the remaining part of the chapter there. And it reads like this. Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him and said, Thou also was with Jesus the Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I don't know what thou sayest. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech bereaved thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. He remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock will thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. <coughs> Let us now to bow our heads and pray and ask God's blessing on the reading of his word. Father in heaven, it's already been a blessing to be here tonight. We can leave now and say we've been blessed. We're down to the most important part of any service, though. And that's when the word of God is written and enlarged upon in the sense is given. It falls my lot to do that. I love doing that. I've been doing it most of my life. I want to do it the rest of my life. I especially want to do it tonight. But I realize inherently I do not possess the ability to do that, for I realize preaching is not merely a demonstration of the flesh. But it is a matter of declaring the Word of God and the power and demonstration of the Spirit of God. So my prayer tonight is that you breathe on the service and breathe on the sermon and breathe on my sermon tonight. And uh, help me to declare deliberately the Word of God so clearly, so emphatically, so powerfully, so effectively that none of us would leave here tonight unchanged and untouched by it. Help me love these people tonight as I preach to them as if I and myself were their pastor. I'll be grateful for what you do and give you the praise for it in advance. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, way of introduction, I want to raise two questions about and answer two questions about the subject backsliding. And the uh, first question I'll raise tonight is what is a backslider? <clears throat> answer that from the Bible. He is one who is born again. Thank God for the new birth. I'm glad I'm born again, aren't you? The Bible said in 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of being corruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Amen. Sounds like security to me. Amen. Amen. God. Many years ago, we lived a great preacher by the name of George Whitefield, and someone asked him, that, by the way, he was refuted to preach on the subject, he must be born again over a thousand times. Someone asked him, said, why, Mr. Whitefield, are you always preaching on the subject, you must be born again? He said, because you must be born again. And he preached on it again. Because you must be born again. And now listen, going to heaven is not being a Baptist, it's not being a Methodist, it's not being a Presbyterian. All that stuff is secondary. The primary requirement for going to heaven is you must be born again. Amen. Every individual who traverses planet Earth owes it to themselves to ask themselves, what is, what is that? What does that mean? And then ascertain, have I been born again or not? Everybody owes it to themselves. You see, if your ambition is to grow up and be a backslider sometime, and you've been saved, you've never been saved, you never made it. You have to get born again first. But notice, secondly, he is a child of God. Because he's born again, he is a child of God. Thank God we're children of God, folks. Amen. We're not in the process of becoming. We're not going to be. We are children of God. The Bible makes that clear. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, The whole of manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world loveth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that we shall appear. We shall be like him, for he shall see him as he is. We are children of God. A backslider is someone who is born again. He is a child of God. In addition to that, a backslider is someone who has returned to secure in Christ. Now, some people might not understand this, but once you get saved, you have a precious commodity of eternal significance called everlasting life. 
And it's not temporary and it's not conditional. And we're, listen, we're not on probation, aren't you glad? Amen. Aren't you glad God didn't say, now I'm going to give you 10 years worth of this. We're going to see how you do it. If you do all right, we're going to give you 10 more. We're just going to go with that. Uh, God didn't do that. He said, I give up to them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And my Father's getting is great to the law, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Amen. Damn, that's Lord. our security to be. Amen. Amen we are secure in Christ Jesus. Uh, you know, if I had been, I have to be honest with you. If I, had been, if I had been dispensing salvation for the Lord, I met a few characters. I just said, I want to give you six weeks worth and see how you do. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll go from there. But God said, we're not doing it that way. In an instrument, a backslider is someone who not only was born again and a child of God and is secure in Christ, he is someone who is walking in the flesh. See, before I got saved, I didn't have the option of walking in the spirit of the flesh. I was what the Bible would describe in theological terms as a natural man at the mercy of the world, the flesh, and the devil. I didn't realize what it was. After you get saved, though, you have the option. You can walk in the spirit or walk in the flesh. And all of us here tonight who are saved know exactly what I'm talking about. Amen. Paul said in Galatians 5, 16, This I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. You know what he's saying in, in theater phraseology? He's saying, if you turn it over to Jesus, the lust of the flesh does not translate into actions in your life. Turn it over to the Lord, he said. That's what verse 16 is all about, Galatians 5, 16. So, preacher, I have to deal with the lust. Uh, with lust. You're going to have to deal with that regardless of how long you live. As long as you live in this body you're living in, you have the lust of the flesh to deal with. In one way or another, you're going to have that to deal with. But Paul says it doesn't translate into actions if you turn it over to God. I like what Mark Luther said once. He said, and in this context, he said, when Satan knocks at my door, I dare not go to the door, but I send Jesus to the door. And when the devil sees the nail scarred hands of Jesus, he always flees. And that is where our safety net is. Amen. Amen. The Bible said, Matthew 26, 41, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the fraction of it. Uh, well, Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray that you are not the temptation. The spirit in me is willing, but the flesh is weak. John 6, 6 to 3. The flesh profiteth nothing. I'm telling you, God doesn't pull any punches, folks, when he's talking about the flesh. Man, he just lays it on the line. But notice something else. A backslider of someone is subject to chase me. Now, the Bible said in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth chasten not? But if you endure not just taste, but we are all the partakers, then your bastards are not sons. Now, what the Bible is saying there is this God chastens his own, he does not chasten those who are not his. Now, here's the point I want to make with this. If it wasn't for the doctrine of eternal security, the doctrine of chastening would never have an application in the Bible. Here's why. If you could be lost again, one sin would get you lost. James 2.10, Whosoever shall keep the whole law yet offended, one point he is guilty of all. One sin would get you lost, and if that happened, God wouldn't chasten you because you wouldn't be his anymore. And if you didn't sin, he'd have no reason to, and so God would never have any use for the doctrine of chastening. You know why it's there? Because Christians don't behave themselves yeah. like children, and the Father has to come and pay them a visit sometimes. And, and He does that, and love us, and love pretend you don't know what this is about. Here's another question. What is backsliding? Not only what is a backsliding, what is backsliding? The dictionary defines it like this. You turn gradually from the faith and practice of Christianity. And of course, you can backslide from anything. Uh, you've heard the proverbial frog story, haven't you? Where supposedly someone threw a frog in a vat of hot water. And the frog leaped out and hard, and they filled the vat with lukewarm water and threw the frog into the lukewarm water. And, and the frog settles in, and they turn the heat up underneath the vat, and it comes up so slowly, the frog becomes acclimated to the change. And after a while, it's a boiled frog because you realize, before you realize what happened. And I know that's just something that somebody made up, but it illustrates the truth. Uh, we don't backslide by blowout, we backslide by slow leak. So I said, we don't lose our victory because blowout, we lose it because of slow leak. You know, you, um, you, you, ne you never know anyone 
The Spirit of God prayerfully, faithfully to 12 o'clock noon one day and plunged into sin where they never seen. You don't look at like that. When a person backslides externally, it's because internally it's been going on for a while. And finally, it comes out. The two categories of backsliders, and I'm giving this just as a backdrop for the sermon I want to preach tonight. There are public backsliders, and uh, there are six things that characterize the public backslider. He has ceased to patronize the house of God. Yeah. And I'm saying that, I emphasize that, because if you knock on doors very much, you're going to find somebody out there that hasn't been to church in 20 years, doesn't plan to go back to church, and they'll swear to you they love God as much as anybody does, and the Lord's saying they're not telling you the truth. Yeah. They're not telling you. People, listen, when people lay out of church, stay out of church, deliberately stay away from church, they are backslidden. That's a public backslider. Cease to patronize that God. They cease to pray. They cease to pay their tithes. They cease to practice their faith. They cease to point souls to Christ. They cease to pour over the scriptures. And the list can go on and on. Public backsliders. Listen, that person knows they're backslid. God knows they are. Everybody else that knows they're listen. There's another category, though. It's called private backsliders. And private backsliders still most likely uh, patronize the house of God. They would pray if they get called up. They would give out a track if they got cornered somewhere, you know. You know how some people give out tracks. They, they have a track in their hand. Don't worry about to see it, of course, but they have a track in their hand and look both ways. And, uh, and they look twice, and they will lay it down and look for their life, you know. But then we're talking about private backsliders. They've lost their fire. They've lost their fervor. They've lost their faith. They've lost their fruit. They've lost the fulfillment of the Christian life in their life. Hebrews 12, 3 says, For consider him that endures such contradiction centers against himself, lest to be weird in faith in your minds, which means in your heart. Which really means this, in my, in my opinion. Live conscious, cognizant of what it cost Jesus to save you. Don't ever start thinking about what it's costing you to serve Him. If you do, you'll, you'll find a human reason to quit on God. Man, if, you all, if you'll just remain conscious of what He did for you. My, the price that He had to pay. Listen, we don't know half of it, folks. We read about it, we still don't know the price that was paid for us. If I'm talking about the extent of suffering. Humiliation and everything was involved in that. And uh, wherever I preach, in whatever church I preach in, if there are very many people there at all, I can assume there are private backsliders in the midst. Because all of us know what I'm talking about when I say that. Now, having said that, I'm going to give you four things tonight that I'll send my thoughts around about backsliding. If you're making notes, you might want to write this down. There is, first of all, the potential of backsliding. There is a potential for that. James 1.14 said, Every man is tempted when he's drawn to live as a lust enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, therefore, my beloved brethren, James said. The two very important things to keep in mind in relation to that. One is this, the exceptions are none. I am no exception. Your pastor is godly man as he is. He is no exception. You're no exception. You don't know anyone that's an exception. There are no exceptions when it comes to the potential of backsliding. Every one of us have to be aware of that. The exceptions of it, verse 31 starts like this. All ye. And where I came from, all means all, and that's all, all me. Amen. All ye shall be offended because of me this night. Now I'm saying that because Peter particularly was warned about this. You know why? He thought he was an exception. And that pretty well comes out clearly later. In verse 41, by the way, I've used that verse probably a thousand times in my own personal Christian life. But the first application, the very first application was to Simon Peter. Watch and pray the inner not the temptation of the spirit and need for willing of the flesh. God is saying that's a sign of here. As a matter of fact, in the book of Mark, chapter 22, verse 31, he said, Satan hath deserved to have you, but it is sent to his wheat. Uh, by the way, Satan desires to have you. Amen. He desires to have those little children. Amen. Yeah. Those grandchildren, your children, your grandchildren. Uh, sometimes I see a couple with cute little kids and I just tell them, the devil wants this kid. Be sure he doesn't get it. The devil wants all these kids. By the way, he's getting all the kids in these days. I said the exceptions tonight. He was warned about that. And by the way, we're warned about that. 
I mean, verses like uh, Proverbs 16 and 18, pride goes before destruction and the Holy Spirit before fall. And in verses like uh, Proverbs 29 and 23, a man's pride shall bring him low. We can backslide through that. Uh, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10 12, Wherefore to him that thinketh he stand to take heed lest he fall. In other words, just about the time you think you reached a comfort zone and you can cruise for a while, my advice is look around because you're probably skating on thin ice. We can never get the, by the way, there is no comfort zone to serve God in. Amen. You know why these generic churches are sprouting up all over the United States and Canada now? They're filling large buildings because people from churches like this are leaving and going there. And they're not winning souls, folks, but they're building their church out of church members from churches like this. Somebody looking for a comfort zone. There is no comfort zone. Somebody say amen. Amen. Not on this side, amen. There's no comfort zone here. But anyway, I was talking about the exceptions. And I, I wrote about a pastor that had a man in his church that fell into sin. And it broke the pastor's heart, as it would any good pastor. He got his men together in a private setting and began to explain to them as much in detail as he should what had happened in this man's life. And uh, so they listened. And finally, he began to interrogate these men. He started on one side and all over this half circle. And then he asked them this question. Had you been in our brother's place, what do you think he would have done? The first man said, I assure you, Pastor, I would not have done as he did. The next man, same answer, same answer, all over the way. Finally, to the very last man, brother, had you been in our brother's place, what do you think you would have done? His eyes welled up with tears. His voice began to tremble. He said, Pastor, I fear greatly had I been in his place, I would have fallen lower than he did. The pastor very wisely said, dear brother, it's you I want to go with me and visit our brother who has fallen into sin. You know why? We're not an exception. None of us are exceptions, right? Yeah. You know what the Bible says in Galatians 6 1? Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye are to spirit to restore such a one, and the spirit of meekness, consider thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now, uh, that word overtaken, there's a very important term, folks. When I think of that, I think about David walking out on his roof one day in the afternoon late, where he shouldn't have been, by the way. And he saw a beautiful woman bathing, maybe down the street on the way. And uh, his flesh got him. By the way, he's responsible totally for what he did. Right. But the fact that he was where he shouldn't have been is the reason why he was overtaken in a fall. There's no premeditation on David's part. He wasn't out there looking for an opportunity to fall into sin. Amen. But he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And listen, his flesh got him. When you hear about somebody falling into sin, folks, you don't have to know them to know this. Their flesh got them. If the devil gets you, he's going to get you through your flesh. Amen. Your flesh is more regenerated now than it was before you got saved. Amen. Paul made this statement in Galatians, uh, excuse me, in 1 Corinthians 9 27. But I keep under my body and bring it in subjection, lest by any means, when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Can I emphasize this? Paul is the greatest Christian I've ever read after. Inside or outside the Bible. So what I'm saying is this. The greatest Christian I've ever read after in my entire life said, Hey, I am vulnerable too. There are no exceptions to this. And I could say more about that. But notice the examples are numerous. I said the exceptions are not the examples are numerous. I, uh, I was raised on a tractor seat in a field in North Alabama. And... Um, you, you didn't guess that I was from Alabama, did you? <laughs> uh, but I was raised out in the field. We, we, my, we, we, had a, we had a farm. My dad rented everything else in the whole area that was available. And so I spent hours and hours and hours in the fields plowing tractor my, by myself. And uh, I never learned to talk to anybody. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want anybody talking to me. Man, I just kind of like said, the more people I meet, the better I like my dog, amen. Amen. <laughs> I have decided I'm going to be a farmer, but I love it. And uh, the first year we had a bad crop and I lost everything I had, and that was in the province of God. God put me on a sales floor in Sears Roebuck and Company in Huntsville, Alabama, where satisfaction is guaranteed to be much cheerfully refunded. Amen. While <laughs> on the sales floor, I had to sell stuff to people. Man, I had to learn to talk to people. And I wasn't supposed to do it, but I gave out tracts occasionally, you know. Yeah. I had my personal yeah. printed business card printed up, and I had some scripture. I wasn't supposed to do it, but I had some over there. <laughs> I slipped one sometimes to somebody, and I, this lady showed up one night. She was in there for one of the products I was supposed to sell there. 
And uh, she discovered I was a Christian. And uh, she was inquisitive. She's now a she's not Baptist, of course. Where she come from, backsliding means you're lost again. And you have to be saved and born again and again and again. Amen, again, again, again. Anyway, we talked for a few minutes. And she said, well, you're back to the center. So you believe in backsliding. She began to believe you're lost again when you're backsliding. She said, you believe in backsliding. I said, ma'am, we don't believe it, we practice it. <laughs> Man, her mouth dropped open. She didn't know what to say about that. <laughs> By the way, did I tell her the truth? Somebody say amen. Amen. I'll tell you when to say amen. <laughs> Lot was an example. I said the example to Nicholas. You know what Lot had to live with the rest of his life? Every morning when he gets up, he had to think about the fact I'm the father of my own grandchildren. They're the progenitors of the Moabites and the Ammonites, which are vicious and perpetual enemies of the Israelites. And he had lived that the rest of his life. I have an idea those Israeli soldiers that cussed, probably cussed him a lot of times when they're out there fighting those Moabites and Ammonites. Mm -hmm. And the lot, we wouldn't have to be out here doing this. But Lot was an example. The first king of Israel was an example. You know what the Bible, listen, God said some impressive things about that guy. The Bible said in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2, a choice young man and a goodly, and there was none among the children of Israel a goodlier than he. I mean, God's word for great folks. This is a great hit to it. Listen, this guy stood head and shoulders above all the other young men in the land. He would have been voted most likely to succeed had there been a vote taken. He's the first king of Israel. Things went well for a while, but after a while, they began to deteriorate from now and for the balance of 40 years, it went downhill until he died a backslider. God cut him off because of his sin. And uh, I believe that. I believe God cut him off. I believe ultimately chastening his death, and I believe God cut him off. What about, what about David, the next king of Israel? God said something about him and never said about anybody else in the Old or the New Testament. Acts 13, 22, a man after God's own heart. Amen. So how could a man after God's own heart do such desperate deeds that he had flesh? Amen? Yeah. Flesh. That explains it all. Flesh. His flesh got it. What about Solomon, the third king of Israel? The Bible declares in 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, that this man is the wisest man who has ever lived on planet Earth, or ever would live on planet Earth, outside Jesus Christ, of course. He did some dumb things. He married 700 wives. That's not very wise. It goes downhill from there. You have 700 mother-in-laws in there. <laughs> You know, I tried to. I just tried to measure. I tried to calculate his income in U.S. dollars, and I'm pretty good at math, but I got lost. He had, he had a fabulous income. But had there been a Baptist mall close by, I'm talking about Walmart, but had a Walmart close by with 700 wives and their mothers, they could have broken Solomon up. By the way, I have to be careful what I say about Walmart. My wife is a regular patron of Walmart. <laughs> She has a little Toyota Highlander. And uh, you won't believe this. We can start down Highway 431 in Boaz and turn the steering wheel loose, and it turns in at Walmart. That's its own parking lot. I don't know if you know this or not, folks, but I, I, I learned lately that Walmart's involved in a scheme and people don't know it. And I'm going to tell you about it. So, preacher, what is it? We need to know. They have a scheme, and the scheme is to separate you from your money. <laughs> so I told you, people don't know it. Oh, yeah. Parking lots are full everywhere you go. Anyway, I don't know. I told you this, and I heard about one burned down when they finally left 2,500 women told us. I don't know. What to say. <laughs> but listen, we're talking about individuals here, and listen, whole churches, the Ephesian church, Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. One of the most commended churches are the seven mentioned in those two chapters, chapters 2 and 3. But in chapter 2, verse 4, nevertheless, have someone against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Repent and return and do the first works. God's message to them was not go ye, it was repent ye, and go back and do the first works. By the way, the Ephesian church died from the pages of history. There is no Ephesian church now. Hasn't been for many, many years. You know why? They became private backsliders. 
You know what a private backslider is? Someone's going to be a public backslider unless they do something about it. You know what a public backslider is? Someone who used to be a private backslider. They didn't get it corrected. But notice, no, but you'll notice the process. There are two facts that are obvious here. It is the fact that Peter backslid. See, before the fact, the three things that impressed me about him, he obviously was a saved man. <coughs> you remember, how about Matthew 16, uh, chapter 16, verse uh, 13, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea for the time, he asked the disciples, saying, Him the men say that I'm the Son of Man, and they said something about Chum the Baptist and some of the last ones of Jeremiah's will of God. He said unto them, Who say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He gave the clearest declaration of faith in any disciple. Same thing in John chapter 6, verse 67, 68, and so He was a saved man, if any of those guys were. In addition, he was an inner circle disciple. And I submit some evidence of that in uh, Matthew chapter 17 and verses 1 through 8. Jesus went upon the Mount of Transfiguration. You know, he took with him Peter, James, and John. These are not perimeter disciples, folks. He is an inner circle disciple. You remember that story. In addition to that, when the, in Mark chapter 5, Jairus' daughter was deathly ill. They said for Jesus, he finally gets down there. She's, uh, she's deceased by now. And Jesus said, hey, she's the, she just made them asleep. They laughed and the scorn. He put everybody out except Peter, James, and John. And uh, raised her back to life again. Of course, for healers, they know that. When Jesus went a little further in the garden, you know who went with him? Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. He is an inner circle disciple. He is a saved man. He is the one who is recorded as audibly saying, verse 33 and verse 35, I will never leave thee. I will never forsake thee. If I have to die with you, he said, I'll die with you. By the way, I believe in it. I believe he meant it, but you know our problem sometimes is we say, if I know my heart, and we really don't know my heart. Can I tell you the main reason I believe God puts us to test sometimes? It's not so that he'll know what we can do or will do. It's so that we'll know what we will do. Amen. Because many times we don't know our hearts. As a matter of fact, before the fact he's a saved man, he's an inner circle disciple, I tell you, he's with the Lord all the way. But after the fact, verse 74, then he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know nothing. I've told you I don't talk about that. See, it is a fact that apostles involved here. Let me give it to you very briefly. First of all, there was a failure to recognize his own weakness. When I say that, may every one of us here tonight realize I also have some areas that need to be shown up. Because we do. Um, verse 33, here's what he said. Though all men should be offended because of thee, I will never be offended. Verse 35, though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Well, I'll tell you something. Without Jesus, we can do nothing, we know nothing, we are nothing. Amen. Does the Bible prove that? Bear it out? Sure. Yes. Yeah. You might be encouraged to know that I get rid of all my sermons out of the Bible. <laughs> my lessons come out of the Bible. Yeah. Praise the Lord. When I say that, John 15, verse 5, Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. So what's the sound of the Greek? Same thing. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Same thing. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 8, 2, if a man think he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing as he ought to know. In Galatians 6, 3, if a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceiveth himself. So those three verses are telling us without Jesus, we can do nothing, we know nothing, we are nothing. As one preacher said once in my hearing, without Jesus, we're nothing but a zero with the rim knocked off. Amen. <laughs> my infinitesimal, amen, without Jesus. By the way, there's a failure to recognize his own weakness. In addition to that, there was the fear of man. Verse 56 says, Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. The Bible declares in Proverbs 29 35, The fear of man bringeth a snare. You know why you can't get very many people to go out and knock on doors? They won't say this, but it's because they're afraid of what's behind them. So, oh, preacher, we're not like you, preachers. We're not, we're not brave like you are. Listen, may I remind you, we're all cut off the same chunk of flesh. I remember when I passed in Fort Pierce, Florida, we knocked on doors, I'm telling you, thousands of doors there. And I was out one afternoon, it happened to be by myself that, that afternoon, and knocked on the door. A fellow came and swung that, down in South Florida, a lot of the doors swing out, the front doors. He swung that door out, 
looked down on me. He was in Tyler too. He stood about six foot sixteen. He wanted to know in no uncertain terms what I'm doing in his house. I started saying, but, 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 looking for a man around the avenue, can you can you can you can you can you tell me what time you did? But I did, and I said, my name is Gerald Field. I'm pastor of the Manual Baptist Church. I want to meet you and your family, find out where you attend church, invite you to our church. Listen, our visit didn't last long. And if I told you he didn't intimidate me, I'd be lying to you. Because we're all cut off the same trunk of flesh, for the church. All of us are. I remember when I first went into evangelism. I, uh, I moved a thousand miles of north from South Florida to First Baptist Church in Milford, Ohio, where Dr. Charles Keene was. He invited me to come there and work out at the church. And so I did, and I got a cool reception. <coughs> it was 20 below zero. <laughs> I didn't know the make weather like that. But anyway, I moved there. Didn't have one meeting booked. Never tried to book any meetings. Anyway, uh, a fellow up in the Upper Peninsula heard that I was there. And someone said, Dr. Gerald Fielder is a great soul winner, and you ought to have him up here. And it sounded, I mean, it wasn't true, folks, but it sounded so good, I didn't review him. Never did. <laughs> he got in touch with me, and I didn't have a four opening, spring, summer, fall, and winter at that time. So it worked out a day. We got up there, he wanted me to go with him to visit the man, and I'm beginning to feel a little suspicious about this. And uh, I was. I was going to learn that some pastors will take the evangelist out to visit somebody that sort of broken the point off there about his plow that's been out there. And he's already shot one evangelist and a friend. If he shoots one more, he'll get out of conviction and get saved. <laughs> we get out there and the guy wants to home. Ah, oh, preacher, you prayed that. You prayed that. You asked God. No, I didn't. The Bible said he'll answer before you ask. <laughs> anyway, he said, let's visit his wife. She's a faithful member of the church. We'll go ahead and sit down. Today, I think it was a setup. He took the odd chair here, she took the odd chair there, Brother Fielder got the sofa, and they talked and talked and talked and talked, and I'm ready to go, but they just keep talking. And the guy drives up, <laughs> parks his little truck, comes in, pops down right beside of me. I knew I was elected, I reached in my pocket, got my sword out, told that fellow how to be saved. I, I learned he was a 73 year old Roman Catholic, and under my breath, I'm thinking, I'm thinking and he's probably going to stay that way. I told him how to get saved. I said, sir, would you like to be saved and know that you're going to heaven when you die? He said, I would. I thought you would. <laughs> <laughs> he got on his knees. I said, you'd be able to do what God wants you to get saved? Yes. He got on his knees, gave his heart to God. He didn't miss a leg, brother. I'm telling you, the rest of his life, he was there. Amen. I thought I'd finally done something for God that his wife stood up and her hands and said, I've been praying for him for 23 years. Amen. I knew who got him saved. I just got him in the list. But here's what I was going to tell you. I went back for another meeting. And the preacher said, I have a man on your visit. And one of my deacons is going to go with him. And uh, I figured that out. He wants to get that deacon knocked off. And he doesn't mind sacrificing a good thing. <laughs> so we go out there, knock on the guy's door. He said, come in. About like that. So we go in, he said, in his kitchen table. He said, in there. I said, down here. The deacon said, here. The doors, entry doors over here. Little table with a lot of gentlemen up on it was under here. And as long as we talked about hunting and fishing and things of that nature, everything went great. Until I started interjecting something about God into the place. He said, I don't want to see any more about that. He did it better than that. He had a lot of experience. But I pastored for 19 years, and I'm part of hearing. I just kept talking something about God. I was going to try to get the witness to the guy. Finally, he raised up like a giant serpent, leaned across the table, and put his finger almost on my nose, and said, I hope you go to hell. And I had a lot of people suggest that this guy was, was serious about it, brother. He insisted on it. And then he started crowding through these articles here. In the meantime, he suggested we leave, and it really wasn't a nice suggestion. That deacon came by me so fast, he almost turned me around in my coat. He's looking for something to help me get to hell. So what were you doing? I'm helping him look. <laughs> I know I feel more spiritual if I have the gun than it would be. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, he wanted me to get out there, but Brother Fielder didn't like to be pushed. I learned that past in Baptist Church. I mean, if I'm sitting at the red light, and the light's red, and you're behind me. 
And that light turns green, you better not blow your horn. Because <laughs> what you do is going to take us longer to get started. <laughs> my wife said, you're the stubbornest man I've ever known about. <laughs> Took her a while to learn that. But anyway, there's the fear of man. There's also the matter of following and fall off. That's what happened here. So preacher, what? What do you mean, following and fall off? By the way, if your Bible is not interesting anymore and the sermons are not feeding you anymore and you don't really care as much about the church, going to church as you, you are following the far off. You better get it right. Amen. You're going to turn into something bad if you don't. There's also a fellowship with enemies of Christ. The Bible said in John 18 and 18, the servants and officers took there and made a fire of coals, for it was cold. And they warmed themselves. Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Have you ever noticed when you get cold spiritually, the world's music is not near as repulsive as it was? And the worldlings are not near as bad as the preachers said they were. And your ungodly friends are just nice people. Because you get away from God. Listen, folks. We have to stay on fire for the Lord and stay. Keep Amen. 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 The Bible said in 1 Corinthians 15 33, be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good memory. Statement of fact. So if a preacher I can take care of myself, no, you can. If you could, God wouldn't be warning us like that. So preacher, I don't know how to conduct myself. Listen, your affiliations, get this, will affect your affections, and your affections will determine your actions. Give it a little bit of time. You are no exception, and I'm no exception. None of us are. Because we live in flesh, a lot of flesh. Then there's that fierce denial of Christ down there. You know what Peter did? He went from being a fierce defender to a fierce denier. Oh. Have you ever seen anybody do that? I said I pastor for 19 years. Occasionally we'd have a family come through that they came in like gangsters. Man, I preach on soul winning. He's on the floor. I mean, he is. Indicting everybody there, get your get your self out here Thursday night, and we're going to go out and knock on some doors. And boy, he is so insistent, persistent about that. A month later, he's missing, we don't even know where he is. They go from fierce defenders to fierce deniers. People do that. There is the potential, there is the process. There's also the pain. Pain results from backsliding. You've heard this expression, sin will carry you further than you ever planned to go, keep you longer than you ever planned to stay, cost you more than you ever planned to do, and I've had a it cost you more than you ever planned to pay. Yeah. It's expensive. I'm going to read some verses you don't have to turn to. Proverbs 131. Therefore shall they eat the fruit of their own way, and be filled with their own devices. Here's another, Proverbs 13, 15. The way of transgressors is hard. Psalm 7, 15, he made a pit digger and has fallen into the ditch which he made. Verse 16, his mischief shall return upon his own head. Psalm 9, 16, the wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. And then we have Galatians 6, 7, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. By the way, folks, that verse is just as true as John 3, 16. Amen. It's a principle that God said, it's in the Bible. And, and you can go back through the whole, whole Bible and find instances of where people reap what they sow. Yeah. God said, it's going to happen. I said I was raised on a farm. I said that earlier. And uh, how many of you raised on a farm, by the way? Raise your hand. Yeah. Several of them were. Right? The rest of you were there on the cross, by the way. <laughs> Don't know the farm. We, put, we had cotton. Cotton was our state and corn. Then we had uh, what we call truck crops, produce through the summer. And uh, I learned this. I learned to hate cotton. I don't want cotton, nothing, about it. Because we had our cotton fields. We had all that Daddy could rent in the whole community. And uh, in the fall of the year, it's up to Gerald that helped, you know, help get that cotton out. And I had to see after the cotton pickers. Amen. I'm not talking about the mechanical ones. I'm talking about the two-legged ones. And uh, I had to look at that. I'd lose about 15, 20 pounds, and I didn't have to lose. Tell me, I'm going to take cotton, folks. I'm not kidding. I don't want anything cotton. Don't buy me anything cotton. <laughs> anyway, here's what I learned. When we planted cotton seed, 100 times out of 100, cotton came up. Now, with us kids, we've been delighted 
if corn had to come. But it never happened. You know why? You reap what you sow. You reap later than you sow, and you reap more than you sow. Laws of the hearts. And most of us have to learn those by the hard way. Nevertheless, it's there. There's the pain of backsliding. It's far reaching. Painful for you, particularly. Verse 75. The Bible said he went out and wept bitterly. By the way, there's no prescription you can get from the drugstore, from your doctor, rather than the drugstore, that will help deal with bitter tears. They're there. Man, there's nothing you can do. Jeremiah 2.19, Thy own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Many dads and mothers have, have wept bitter tears because they take their kids and their family out of a church where a pastor loves them enough to tell them the truth at the risk of losing their friendship, which he does sometimes. And they go to a more liberal church and they lose their kids and they realize what a terrible mistake they made. But it's after the fact now. Yeah. And it's going to be a long way back. i give you an illustration. I'm, I'm hurrying along. I'll be finished here. you never heard anything like that. When I was pastoring in Fort Pierce, Florida, we had a young couple, well, fairly young, they had three children, they were in our Christian school. And, uh, I mean, if, if you look at this family, they were an ideal family. They appeared to, they appeared to love each other, the kids were well met, never had any problem with the kids in school. And, uh, I mean, you'd never think anything was going wrong in this family. They decided that our church might have been a little bit tight for them. And so they went to a church that's a little bit more liberal than what it down. They had not been there but a few weeks until that mother ran off with a teenage boy and left her family. So why did that happen? I think the reason it happened was they got out from under God's protective umbrella. Yeah. And God wasn't obligated to keep 1 Corinthians 10 13. See, 1 Corinthians 10 13 is a promise God made to us, but it's made like you have your eyes on Jesus. As long as you have your eyes on Jesus, God said, all right, I'm not going to let it happen. You get your eyes off the Lord, God's not obligated to keep that promise. And people just jump from one church to another, and they'll end up in trouble somewhere down the road. By the way, if you're in this church and God put you here, don't take that lightly. It's as much His will that you be here as it is that He be here. People, people take that too lightly. Anyway, a uh, lot live with a terrible legacy. David lived with a terrible legacy. You know what he said in Isaiah, excuse me, in Psalm 51? My sin is ever before me. David had to live the rest of his life with that heartache and grief because of his dastardly deeds back there. That he did because of his flesh. It's painful for you. It's painful for your family. If you don't believe that, check with Aiken when you get to heaven. Yeah. He lost his wife and children and all of his assets, including his own life. Because of Gold and silver and clothes, amen. <laughs> Somebody said, I guess a lot of that. His, I'm going to tell you something else. I'm very finished with this. It's painful for your Lord. Have you thought about that? You know what the Bible said in Jeremiah 3 20? Surely as a wife treacherously departed from her husband, so you treacherously departed from your house of Israel, saith the Lord. So, preach, what's that mean? I think it means this. If you can get a handle on the pain a young man feels, when his bride forsakes him for some of the houses. I think that's some of the worst pain a young man can ever, ever, ever deal with. It goes into the recesses of his heart and the marrow of his bones, it abides there, and it takes years for him to get over that. But nevertheless, if you can get a handle on the pain that a young man feels when his bride forsakes him for someone else, then you know how I feel when you forsake me. Surely as a wife treacherously departed from her husband, so if you treacherously departed from your house, this will save the Lord. There is the potential, there's the process, there's the pain. But I'm going to tell you, coming back to God is not like the devil describes it. The devil had you thinking God doesn't have any more use for you and there's no need for you to come back to God. He's not going to listen to you if you do come back. And I'm here to tell you that he welcomes you with a little Praise God. Amen. 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 What about uh, uh, what about the prodigal? Do you yes. remember the prodigal son? Took his part of the inheritance, went out and wasted on righteous living. Found himself out there feeding swine and repulsive occupation for a Jew. Came to himself and said, I know what I'll do. I'm going back to my father and I'm going to tell him I've sinned. No more whether to be called a son, just make me one of the highest servants. By the way, 
This was not a scheme. He did it. Yeah. Right. There's no indication otherwise. Anyway, he heads back home. I suppose he was apprehensive about how he'd be received when he got there. But before he ever got to the house, somebody saw him coming. Yeah. It was his old dad. I have an alley that dad went down that road every day since that boy had been born. That dad saw him coming. He had to know that's my boy. I could imagine him spraying into his feet and shouting over his shoulder, bring a ring for his finger, bring his shoes for his feet. He'd bring, bring a robe for his back, kill the fatty cat. We're going to have a party of our sons coming home. That's the way it is with God. Listen, he's glad to see you come back, amen. Praise the Lord. He's glad to see you hit an altar somewhere and say, Lord, I've sinned. And I want you to forgive me, by the way. It happens, amen. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And to cleanse us of all our righteousness. Praise the Lord. I read about a old girl whose name was Jenny, a Scottish girl. She was the only child. And uh, her family lived in a little cabin out in the rural area, just a remote rural area. When she began to fire into an adult, like sometimes young girls do, she decided she'd like to go to the city and find her life there. She did, and as it happens often, the city wastes those girls. She decided one day she'd like to go back home to her parents. And she decided that I'm going back home, and when I get there, if the door's latched, I'm going to take that to me. I'm not welcome. I'm going back to the life I've made for myself. And uh, all the way home, she lived with that apprehension. Finally, she's inside a little cabin and a little cottage, and she advances to the door. She tries the door, and the door isn't locked. She noticed there was a light in the window. She goes inside. The mother discovered that she was there. They loved on each other for a while and, and hugged each other and embraced each other. And finally, she said, Mother, I had decided if I came back and the door was latched, I wasn't welcome. I was going back to the life I'd made for myself. The mother said, Honey, there hasn't been a day or night passed since you left that the door was unlatched and that the light was in the window. So there's been one there ever since you left. That's what it is with God for us. Praise the Lord. Listen, I'm preaching tonight on a highly relevant subject, especially in our world today. Right. You've been a good audience. You've listened well. I want you to stand. I want a pianist to come and play on an invitation number. Play on an invitation number for us. While we're standing with our heads bowed and eyes closed, Father in Thank you for the word of God. I, I don't really know, Lord, why you spoke in my heart so abruptly. And at such a point as you did to preach this sermon, I preached from this text here before.